you have to take responsibility. And when you take responsibility, you tend to act or react in the positive. And that's the whole process of harmonious relationship. You, you get what you give. Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with thought leaders from not only the entrepreneurial domain, but also from the world of technology, psychology, philosophy, economics, politics, biology, management and leadership, health and fitness, and more to help you think in a multidisciplinary way, avoid relying too heavily on the first piece of information encountered, and ultimately to make better informed decisions so that you can more readily become the person that you want to become. Each and every Friday, I'll also bring you Fast Fix Friday, some short, high impact and easily digestible insights to have you finishing your week on a high. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation accelerator that works with organizations to unlock their latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning those ideas into reality, creating a culture of innovation, or partnering with startups, visit www.collectivecampus.io. Without further ado, let's kick into today's episode. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 272 with Jeffrey Gitoma. Jeffrey is an author, speaker, podcast host, entrepreneur, and the self-professed king of sales. Jeffrey has penned a number of books, including the best-selling sales Bible, which I am personally a huge fan of, as well as the little red book of sales and customer satisfaction is worthless. His forthcoming book, Truthful Living, The First Writings of Napoleon Hill, represents a brief departure from sales. You'll likely be familiar with Napoleon Hill as the author of the magnum opus Think and Grow Rich, which went on to influence generations of people and personal development gurus that came after him. The book explores Hill's self-help legacy, his long-lost original notes, letters and lectures now compiled, edited and annotated for the modern reader. If you're looking for a proverbial kick up the backside, then you've come to the right place place. Jeffrey and I riff on many of Hill's teachings and our own personal observations of them and touch on topics such as 1. Adversity being a blessing, not a curse. 2. The magic key, a formula that will open the door for health and wealth. And 3. Why whatever your goals, it will never be, quote unquote, the right time. With that, strap yourselves in for a conversation that I really enjoyed with the one and only Jeffrey Gitoma. Welcome to the show, Jeffrey. Thank you so kindly. (laughs) It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. I've been a big fan of your work for a number of years. um, Thank you. Such as the the, uh, the sales Bible, which uh, I mentioned before the show, I have shared not only with my own team, but with a lot of fellow entrepreneurs down here in Melbourne, Australia. Um, Thank you for violating my copyright laws. (laughs) (laughs) Well, look. No, it's totally fine. I'm sure, Everyone I'm, does. Sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure they read the book and then went to your website and then signed up to an online course, right? So it's all about the upsell, Jeffrey. You should know this. I'm hoping. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, look, our audience, like I mentioned, will probably be familiar with you um, from books such as the Sales Bible, which has sold something to the order of over 200,000 copies, probably more. This is probably an old stat. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's, yeah, it sold a lot of copies. It's sold, very- it sold a lot of copies. But um, mm-hmm. you've actually got a new book on the way. It comes out in October called Truthful Living, um, which is all yeah. about the first writings of Napoleon Hill. Now, um, I guess for our audience, I mean, many of them would be familiar with Napoleon Hill. But for those who aren't, for those who perhaps haven't read his shall we say, magnum opus, think and grow rich. Who was Napoleon Hill and why was he such a seminal figure? Napoleon Hill was, in fact, the father or the grandfather in the United States of positive attitude and personal development. And he concentrated on both at the same time. 
He began writing in 1917, but his first magnum opus book, uh, Think and Grow Rich, didn't come out until 1937. So there was 20 years of, of initial writings that were thought to be lost. Mm. I've had a relationship with the Napoleon Hill Foundation for a little more than a decade because when I read Think and Grow Rich, it gave me, literally gave me a positive attitude for life. I read it 10 times in one year. Wow. Wow. Well, I'm a fanatical student of personal development and positive attitude. And when you're fanatical, you do what other people won't do. And yeah, so I, I have a great positive relationship with them. And when they found these documents, they called me and said, hey, would you like to annotate these and get them ready for 21st century production? I go, Yeah. So literally all of the big cheeses of Napoleon Hill Foundation flew to Charlotte, uh, presented me with three photocopies, uh, three volumes that were photocopies of the original documents. And I spent almost two years putting everything together to make uh, sense out of it from a standpoint of how can the modern reader get this and put it into action? Because it presents truths that although they're 100 years old, are still brand new. Mm. No, if you're, if if anyone out there is a is a, has read Think and Grow Rich, or even if you haven't read Think and Grow Rich, this is a book that will light the fire inside of your belly to become a better and positive and wealthy person. Yeah, I could not agree more on that, Jeffrey. And um, you've basically answered my first four questions about how this all came about, your affiliation with the Napoleon um, oh, Hill Group. And I'm so wrecking on. your interview. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good. I've got plenty of more where that came from. But um, Oh, please. <laughs> so I guess, you know, on these you, – you mentioned – that when you first encountered Napoleon Hill, it completely changed your life. It helped you develop yes. the positive attitude that you have today. And we were riffing for a few minutes before we started recording today. And you definitely have a positive, um, outgoing attitude. Um, it's, it's quite infectious. Um, but, you know, if you look at some of the, the guys today on the scene, such as your Tony Robbinses of the world, say your Seth Godin's, um, say your Tim Ferriss's, they often owe a lot of uh, their sort of mindset, their philosophies to guys like Napoleon Hill, to guys like, say, even Zig Ziglar. Now, um, in terms of Napoleon Hill, I mean, who were his influences? Were they um, philosophers from the 19th century? Were they, say, Greek philosophers like Socrates um, or Epictetus? Where does it come from? Well, there were several predecessors from Napoleon Hill. Mm -hmm. The first credited uh, self-help person was Samuel Smiles from Great Britain, who actually, and I don't mean to swear on the Australian show, but when I say Great Britain, but uh, he wrote in the 1850s two books, one called Character and one called Self-Help. And everyone who post-seated him read them. They're small type, they're 500-page books, but... He and a lot of it is religious based. A lot of it is God based. So his the, the next guy after him was a guy named Arison Sweat Martin, who, in fact, founded Success Magazine in America in the early 1900s and wrote 41 books on the subject of getting better. Uh, titles like He Who Thinks He Can and Every Man is a King. Uh, but he was a positive attitude and a salesperson like Napoleon Hill, and preceded Napoleon Hill by about 20 years. So all of these people, and uh, not, not just Arson Sweat Martin, but a guy named Robert Collier, who wrote a, a bunch of things on positive attitude, but again, religious-based things. And I, I can't tell you, because I, I don't, he don't, he doesn't record, Napoleon Hill doesn't record where he learned it. He'll often quote, uh, uh, a remark from the Bible or something from uh, Plato or Cicero, but nothing in depth. Uh, he never revealed the origin of his learnings. Maybe he didn't want to. Maybe he uh, borrowed some things that he shouldn't have borrowed. Um, if you read, uh, for example, if you read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, uh, seek first to understand and then be understood. Habit number three. Mm -hmm came from St. Francis of Assisi in 1100. So there's pretty much nothing new. Yeah. And 
what I want to what I wanted to do with the Napoleon Hill documents was to share with people like, hey, wake up. It's not brand new, but it's still valid and valuable. And if you're going to be a student of success, then you have to know where it came from and you have to know why it's there. And so when you when, when he says things like finish what you start. How obvious can that be? <laughs> Yet, how many people leave a project halfway done? Yeah, yeah. I think common sense isn't very common. And that was going to be one of my questions, Jeffrey. I mean, there are, uh, you walk down your bookstore, if, if you still have a bookstore in your town, and, and there's yep. quite a few books d- down the motivational aisle, down the philosophy aisle, about how you can become a better person, how you can develop a positive attitude, um, how yep. you can show up in the face of adversity, and so on. So there's numerous places people can go to learn these types of things, right? So. Having said that, it's as if oftentimes, like you said, common sense, such as finish what you started, isn't so common. And that revisiting some of these original teachings um, will just provide people some of those fundamental learnings that they need to just apply in their lives or, or carry as an operating system with them to perform in every other um, aspect of life because the world is fast changing. I mean, this podcast is an example of that where, say, 15 years ago, if we wanted to do this, it would have re- required a much greater investment in technology. Oh, my God. In distribution. Oh, my God. All that stuff. Yeah. Everything is changing around us. But in terms of those few truths, such as finish what you started, such as maintain a positive attitude, such as respond with reason, don't react with impulse, it seems like these are things that regardless of what goes on outside of our minds um, are the one true constants that can help us moving forward. Let me share something with you. When Hill looked at the same thing and he said – to anybody who was in his class of students who had said, listen, the first thing you have to do is have the belief that you can do it. The second thing you have to do is have the desire to get it done. And then you have to concentrate on it with your definite major aim and not divert yourself to things that are frivolous. Now, when Hill was writing this, there was no television. Mm. So he would talk about people that went on vacations and did nothing as opposed to going on vacation and thinking about what you needed to do when you got back from vacation and trying to come up with new and better ideas so that when you came back, you were renewed in energy, not taking a vacation and then needing another vacation to recover. Yeah, yeah. So he he really, he hit the nail on the head so many times in this book. It was literally, it was scary. Mm, yeah, I was thinking that same thing going through some of the, well, going through the book and taking out some of the one-liners, I mean, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. And Mm -hmm. you read the same thing today about start with belief and belief will dictate your behavior. Behavior then uh, will dictate the actions and the results and it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy and you start building. everybody, everybody whose current expressions have to do with achievement and positive attitude Mm. will find at their foundation something that Napoleon Hill said or wrote. Yeah. Every single person, me included. Yeah. And, and something um, that really jumped out uh, for me was this line, don't wait, the time will never be just right. And I work with a hell of a lot of startups, Jeffrey. And oftentimes, um, as a result of that, I have want to be entrepreneurs coming to me, asking me, oh, you know, I want to start this business. I've got this idea, um, but I've got this mortgage to pay. Oh, I've got this vacation on the way. Oh, I've got this. All this. Yeah. So many countless excuses, right? Um, is, is what they are. And what I tell them is the time will never be just right. But then exactly. re- reading this, you know, these notes, like you said, they were dug up almost a hundred years ago. He's way ahead, way of, ahead time. of time. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, you've heard the expression, no risk, no reward. I've morphed that over the years to no risk, no nothing. Yeah. So the person who's not willing to take the risk, let them just stay in their job. You know, don't fight it. If you don't believe in your heart that you can do it, don't even start because you're going to work long, you're going to work hard, and you can't quit. This is a matter of finish what you start. So if you're going to go into it, you got to go in with both feet. You can't put one toe in the water to see if the uh, Indian Ocean is cold or hot. Yeah. You put up the bathing suit and you jump in and you swim out to the, uh, whatever that thing is, barrier reef. <laughs> and and when you when you find it, 
you look for the Marlins or you look for Flipper. Yeah. And I guess on that, Jeffrey, I mean, a lot of um, people get into things like entrepreneurship and whatnot because they have some, say, issues or less than optimal circumstances in their existing No, they hate their freaking job. They hate their jobs, right? They hate their freaking boss. Yep. yep. They hate their freaking coworkers. Exactly. They're disgusted. They, they they hate all of that stuff, but they'll then default to entrepreneurship as being the answer. Whereas, I mean, it could Hold be. On. First of all, there has to be two things that exist in that human being before they make that jump. And they are balls. Yep. You have to have balls to make the move. If you don't, it's not going to happen. Otherwise, you're griping and you're not doing anything about it. And what Napoleon Hill said, you have to have a chief aim and make a plan to achieve it. Yep. If you don't have a plan, you're not going anywhere. Mm. So most people want to go someplace but have no plan. Yeah. So on that chief aim, that was something I wanted to tease out. I mean, a lot of people will go down particular paths such as entrepreneurship, for example, and they may have the balls, but maybe they're doing it for the for the wrong reasons. Maybe they just want, uh, maybe their job sucks and that's it. So they're just looking to get away from their job, but there's countless other things they could do. They could find another job. Um, they could work with different people. There's other things they could do. They can enter a different industry, whatever the case may be. Um, and so today there's a lot of um, literature, shall we say, out there from the likes of Simon Sinek and whatnot on find your why. What's that greater purpose? Um, when it comes yep. to that, what, what does Napoleon Hill teach us on that underlying purpose and aim? Very excellent uh, lead in. Napoleon Hill says, find something that you love and master it. Mm -hmm. And don't be distracted by other stupid things that will take away from your mastery purpose. So, for example, you can't love entrepreneurship. You have to love opening up a bicycle shop and being the best bicycler on the planet yep. or opening up a sign shop and being the best sign maker on the planet. And he uses as examples uh, Rockefeller and Carnegie and Schwab and people and, and Henry Ford, people who said, I'm going to build a car. That's it. And I'm going to I'm going to open up a manufacturing plant to build the car. And that's it. And I'm going to set up an assembly line to build the car. And that's it. And he focused his entire life on that. And look what happened. Mm. It's 100 years later and Ford's still around. But it's, it's anybody, you know, Carnegie wanted steel. Whoever wanted something bad. And you look right now at anybody, you know, Jeff Bezos wanted to be the biggest department store in the world. How's that working out? <laughs> and how many people thought that guy was a nut? And his company almost goes broke. Did he quit? No, he's stuck in there. And now a $2 investment would bring you back $2 million. Yeah, and I guess we're seeing that play out with the likes of Elon Musk as well, with Tesla and SpaceX. And um, like you said, the book provides a lot of great examples. Um, James Hill, I think that was Orville and Wilbur Wright. Um, yep. you know, air, air, airplanes, obviously, that was the one thing they think about mastering the air, and they became very wealthy as a result of that. Um, I mean, in today's sort of environment where things are moving as fast as they are, and obviously we've cited some modern examples there, Jeff Bezos and um, Elon Musk, is, does that still apply when things are changing so much? Like if you dedicate yourself to one thing and then say in five or 10 years from now, that thing is no longer relevant because it's been automated or technology is displaced. I mean, what's your view on that? My view is that you have a five-year window. Mm -hmm. Milk it. And you could, yeah, you can't tell, you know, I, I got an email from, from uh, some company that pretends they're experts in sales training. And it said, how to prepare your people for, for the coming recession. I'm like, dude, the stock market just hit an all-time high. Yep. Why don't you tell your readers how to milk the cow of the current economic boom, mm -hmm. you moron? I left that, you moron. <laughs> but I, but I, I couldn't believe that somebody would actually say the sky is falling mm -hmm. when, in fact, the, the blue has never been brighter. And, and if I'm going to huddle myself in a hole, uh, I don't know if you follow American football or not, but... The Atlanta Falcons almost beat the New England Patriots two years ago mm -hmm. because after three quarters, they were ahead and they went into a safety game so that they wouldn't lose instead of consider instead of continuing their aggressive game. Yeah. And they lost. Yeah. Sure enough, they lost. The following year, my team, the Philadelphia Eagles, played all four quarters aggressively and they won. So they were prepared. They executed, they were having a great time, and they won. 
Yeah. They played all four quarters. You have to play the game with all your heart every single minute of every single day. And that means no diversion. So I don't want the guy that goes out and drinks all weekend and stumbles over himself and staggers in on Monday morning bragging about how much he or she drank over the weekend. That's not my person. I want a smart person. I want a happy person. I want a a self-starting person. And I want someone with somewhat of a past history of success. That's what our team is about. Mm. And that's how we're winning. Yeah, and I think there's quite a few uh, key points um, that I wanted to touch on there, Jeffrey. I mean, first, the the whole safety game thing, I think that shows up today in a lot of established organizations who have their existing repeatable business model. They've had that for, say, 10 years, maybe 20 years, maybe longer. And all they're looking to do now is just defend that for as long as possible. Exactly. And they also have what is known as a burn rate. Mm -hmm. A burn rate is how many days till you die? Yep. Like, seriously? Go make a fucking sale. Yep. That's how you don't burn. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, cut people, cut expenses, cut your own salary, and go make sales. And instead of having a burn rate, have a success rate. Tell me what you have to do every day in order to make it. Where's that number? Yeah. And that, I guess, comes down to courage as well, which is another exactly. big thing that Napoleon Hill talks about. And people just tend to focus in on the negatives. Like you said a few moments ago, a recession is coming. Um, And I had a conversation with Jason Salk recently. He's a sports psychologist. And this whole notion of a problem-centric thought where human beings tend to focus in on the negative as opposed to all of the positives. And so if we're going to go out there and say, develop a new product or try and sell, why should I pick up this phone? They're probably just going to hang up on you anyway. So if I'm going to operate from that Let those people go get a job as a cashier in a grocery store. Yeah, that's the easiest job because they they see the thing, they ring the number, they scan it, then the number pops up and they just say it's eighty four dollars, please. And put your credit card in, bag them up and next. Yeah. And that's the life because it's safe. It's self-limiting and totally self-limited. Um, one of the one of the thing, couple of the things that Napoleon Hill uh, talked about. Number one was what I've been talking about is master whatever you're doing. But he talks about the foundation of mastery, which is ambition. Like, what do you really aspire to become? Not who are you at this moment. But I've I've said for years, make all decisions based on the person you want to become. Not on who you are at the moment or what your quota is. Yeah. Um, It's amazing to me how many people are willing to settle for what's now. And and drink about it on Friday night until there's no tomorrow, and I don't know what the hell. Yeah, and look, um, I mean, if I look back on my, say, early to mid-20s, um, when I was gainfully employed, shall we say, um, but miserable at the same time, I found myself drinking more often on weekends, whereas now, if I drink, it's maybe one or two uh, glasses of wine socially once or twice a week, maybe a whiskey here and there, but that's basically it. it, it the, the whole desire to forget about right. work, it's just not there. But ultimately, it comes back to that underlying sort of purpose. Like You've got to believe in what you're doing. You've got to have that aim, that drive. Um, it's got to f- you know, feed your soul in some way so you keep going. Mm-hmm. So anything you do that's going to detract from that, you actually don't want to do it. Um, but a couple of things there that you touched on is the person that you want to become rather than just who you are today. And a lot of research shows that two factors that um, successful people share. One is obviously conscientiousness and the other one is uh, the ability to delay gratification. So oftentimes, you, Correct. you need yes. to sacrifice now to, in order to become the person you want to become tomorrow. Without a doubt. There has to be some kind of uh, a delay that you put into your soul that allows you not to take that vacation that you really want to take. But uh, if you delay it for two or three years, you can buy a house on the beach and have your vacation instead of struggle to get to the weekend thing and spend all your money. Yeah. But uh, let me think it further. Because there, I owe your audience a little bit of meat into the process of how. Napoleon Hill in the book creates what is known as the law of harmonious attraction. Not the law of attraction, the law of harmonious attraction. And what he says is that using the, using the, the euphemism that it's better to give than receive, he starts out by giving something and the other person tends to reciprocate. And that's what builds the relationship. He says, even with people you don't like, 
If you walk up to them, smile, shake their hand, see how they're doing, and offer your help, you're way more apt to succeed than somebody who says, you know what, dude, you're a jackass. Mm -hmm. And if you want to look at the world of politics, that's the perfect example of blaming. And what Napoleon Hill says is you have to take responsibility. And when you take responsibility, you tend to act or react in the positive. And that's the whole process of harmonious relationship. You, you get what you give. Yeah, I really like that. And again, that underlying theme here that kind of binds what Napoleon Hill was talking about 100 years ago to now. I mean, that whole notion of you get what you give. A conversation I had with Brad Feld, one of the world's leading uh, venture capitalists. Um, he was talking about the, the startup ecosystem in Silicon Valley and in Boulder, Colorado, and how if you've made it as an entrepreneur, there's this whole notion of give first. Um, give Right. Give it, if you give first, then eventually you'll get back, but you don't give first with the expectation that you will get back. You give first because that's right. what you do. And the, the, the laws of the universe eventually just give you uh, what you're looking for in the long term. It is a thousand percent correct. You give without measuring and you give without expectation. And then instead of you owing me one, the world will pay me back. Yes. And the world will pay me back times 10 every time. Yeah. Every single time. And there's example after example of it in the book, Truthful Living. Yep. So, I mean, you've touched on the, the, the law of harmonious uh, attraction. I'd love for you to uh, deep dive, on, well, double click rather, on the great magic key, Jeffrey. Well, um, the great magic key talks about concentration. Mm -hmm. And you can apply it to any single thing that you do, and it will become better because you're focused in rather than uh, diverted away. And today you have diversions like email and texts and any other thing that comes your way, someone knocking at your door. In those other days, there, there was no hardly any phone. Uh, you know, in 1917, what the hell did people do? And the answer was they sometimes had a phone, they sometimes had a car, sometimes the roads were paved. They had to take a train if they wanted to go someplace because the aeroplane hadn't really come about yet. Um, if you wanted to go from New York to Chicago, you pretty much had to walk. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, you take a train and they had planes, but they were limited and very expensive. So the bottom line was people had less diversions than they have right now. Right now you're diverted literally instantaneously. People wake up and they watch crap. Let me give people my five piece formula for what I've done for the past 25 years. Mm -hmm. I wake up and I read, I wake up and I write, or I wake up and I prepare, or all three. Read, write, prepare. Yeah. That's part of, a, of an equation. And underneath that fraction of read, write, prepare is think and create. Reading, writing, preparing requires thinking. And it requires creativity. And it requires the ability to create something. So maybe I'll tweet it, or maybe I'll write it down as a thought, or maybe I'll put it into one of my books that I write. But whatever it is, I'm productive before the hour of seven o'clock. And while most people are sleeping, I'm making money. Yep. So I, you know, and people, well, I have children. You know what? I have a nine year old daughter. I feed her every morning that I have her. It's week on, week off. I, I take her to school. I walk her to school, rain or shine. And you know what? Somehow I still get my equation done. Mm. It's amazing what you can do with a little bit of determination. Yeah. Well, it's amazing what you can do with the right amount of focus as well. I mean, you have people out there who like to brag about working, say, 16-hour days. But of those 16 hours, they're probably only really present for four. And the rest of the time, they're being uh, interrupted, checking their phone. They've got notifications popping up on the screen. They're in me pointless meetings to prepare for meetings. They're taking really exactly. long lunches with people that don't matter. And then they're complaining that they can't stay on top of their workload. But um, you know, I've spoken with a lot of psychologists on this show, and we've it unpack the whole notion of flow where you just get rid of interruptions and you just teach your brain to focus. And, and in that sort of headspace, you can get so much more done in say four hours, for example, of serious focus than you could in say 12 hours of just uh, surface level sort of presence. I, I'm going to say this. 
if I'm going to work an 18 hour day, it's because I'm on a writing retreat Mm -hmm. and I'm going to be focused in and concentrated on what the next chapter is or putting an outline together or editing or trying to create something. And I'll do that from early on in the morning until I need a break because at some point you need a mental break. So I'll walk, run, exercise, do something that um, sometimes I listen to music. Mm -hmm. uh, Music, Jeffrey. Uh, the Sales Bible, which you brought up, was finished by Leonard Cohen. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I, I listened to Leonard Cohen's, you know, Suzanne, and hey, that's no way to say goodbye. And it's funny when I saw, I've seen him twice in concert before he passed on. And the very first time that I saw him and he started to play the songs that I finished the Sales Bible to, I started to cry. Mm. Because songs aren't just there to entertain you. They create a memory. Yeah. And that memory is almost a clear vision of where you were and what you were doing at that time. If I play the right song for you, I can take you back to your first date, your first kiss, mm-hmm. or your first wife. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've had uh, countless uh, songs that I can think of where it would take me back to, say, high school or you name it. And I think it is one of these things that tends to tends to bind us. Um, and I guess you, you know, you've touched on there your morning routine. You wake up, you tend to read, write, create. You're making money while other people are still sleeping, as you like to say. Um, you know, I'm a big proponent of that type of approach. I tend to not look at my phone for about an hour after I wake up and just have a number of things that I do to get that mental clarity and headspace. Um, I think it's so easy for people to just reach for their phone and just open up, say, Twitter or Instagram and just mindlessly scroll through and yeah. just allowing technology to just hijack your brain throughout the entire day. I mean, do you have any sort of uh, routines inspired perhaps by uh, Napoleon Hill and the whole notion of focus that helps you stay focused throughout your day, not just, uh, say, your morning routine? You asked me about it, and I gave you the answer in terms of the magic key. It's concentration. Yeah. I focus on what I'm doing without distraction. And um, my compound where I live is a bunch of – I live in an old factory and we work in the same place that I live, but my home space is separated from the office space. So I'm always here alone upstairs and I'm rarely interrupted unless somebody really needs me. And then they'll text me Mm. or sometimes they'll walk in if it's urgent, but I'm alone to focus on what it is that I'm trying to do. It took me two years to put this, this particular book together because it wasn't my writing and I wanted to honor what it was, but I needed to focus on it and concentrate on it because it was written in another form of English. Mm. You know, a hundred years ago, people's lexicon was not the same as it is today. And I had to deal with that. And I had to deal with all of the uh, euphemisms and idioms that were, that existed in 1917 that no longer exist in 2017. Yeah. So it was a it was uh, it required a lot of work. There was no chore about it. It was a total blissful thing. But I couldn't take away a month from the from my business to focus on that particular writing. So I did it two or three bites at a time, and finally it emerged. Yeah. But my my editor, who is also my fiance. Would read the would read all of the, the the grammatical things, and she would be texting me. Did you see this one? Did you see this one? And she's <laughs> she's texting me all these lines and quotes from the book, and she herself is a student of attitude and personal development. And we're still learning new things from this book. But um, let me go back and make certain I, that I've shared with you that the key is concentration. Mm-hmm. If you don't have, if you're unable to concentrate because of stupid diversions, you're not going to be able to to have outcomes that are what you're hoping for. They'll always be mediocre because you had to do this or you had to do that. But do like focus in, cut yourself off from humanity for a while and go into a deeper state of thought. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. And I think some of our listeners will be familiar with that, but for those who aren't, I mean, concentration is everything. Uh, earlier in the episode, Jeffrey, we talked about uh, that window 
you know, that you've got a five year window, milk it. And right. the David Bowie and Ziggy Stardust. Yeah. You and got five years. You got five years. And it's, it's, it's interesting because conversations I've had with guys like uh, Kevin Kelly, the founder of Wired Magazine, who's considered a mm-hmm. futurist, technologist, you name it. His biggest thing was saying that the number one thing that sh- children need to learn today is learning how to learn because they are constantly going to have to be uh, moving with the punches. They they can't just expect to go to school, learn something, and do that for the next, say, 30 or 40 years. And like you said, I think that ties in perfectly with what you said there about there being a five-year window. Yeah, I agree. And I'd like to add something to that, which is in my philosophy. If you want to teach your kids about the world, you show them the world. Yeah. I don't want my kid to read about the Eiffel Tower in a book. I wanted to turn the corner at Trocadero and go, holy shit, there's the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. And I think that there's that there's something to that, that people won't invest in the education of their children. They'll spend a weekend at the beach, <laughs> but they won't spend a weekend at a museum. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something I see firsthand where a lot of people, uh, parents in particular, like you've said, will just spend a week at a resort um, because it's a holiday for them, but what do, what value does it really provide the kids with other than splashing around in the pool playing Marco Polo? Exactly. Um, and it's fun for a day or two. Yeah. But, you know, you can go to Paris in the summer. They have La Plage, yeah. which is a, a beach at the edge of the Seine River. And then you come back and you take a train to Giverny and see Claude Monet's home and yeah. garden and pond. I mean, what if what if some of your, or maybe what's one of your, say, transformational sort of travel experiences been, perhaps uh, as a young lad, Jeffrey? Uh, when I was 20 years old, I was enrolled at Temple University, but I was not a good student. And I, I came downstairs one night and I said to my mom and dad, I said, listen, I said, I'm not doing well at school. I said, I'm going to drop out for a little while. And I think the best thing for me to do is travel to Europe. Mm-hmm. And... It was the wildest Harris brained idea because it was 1967. And both of my parents said, that sounds like a good idea. And you ever get like this wild ass idea and your parents agree with you? Well, when I got to London, I realized I was a I was a foreigner. It said British passports, foreign passports. And I got holy shit, I'm a foreigner. And then I went to Paris and I realized that. I didn't know shit. I couldn't even speak their language. I, 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 so I had to learn how to put myself in someone else's society and absorb it and be part of it and not fight it and not say, well, I'm an American and we know everything and you know nothing. And then when I got to Vienna, I didn't know who the Habsburgs were. <laughs> and I sat down and started to read. I realized I knew nothing because I landed knowing everything. But sure enough, three weeks later, I knew nothing. So I began, my my defining moment was I decided to learn something new every day. That's what I decided when I was there. So I dropped out of school to become a student. I read the diary of Anne Frank on Anne Frank's doorstep. Wow. I dare anybody on the planet to do that. And, and... I, I was crying. I'm sitting on Air Frank's on Air Frank's doorstep, crying my freaking eyes out, and it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. So people have to look at what is the value of travel, and what is the value of adventure, and what is the value of turning a corner and seeing something that you've never seen before. Mm. People refer to it as wanderlust. Thank goodness I have it. Yeah. And I've had it since I was 20. I'm always looking to turn the corner and see something new. Yeah, that Anne Frank story is, is beautiful. And um, I mean, on reaching Paris and realizing that, you know, going very fast, going very quickly from knowing everything to knowing nothing, not knowing the language. Um, I mean, that kind of ties into what Napoleon Hill talks about as well in, in the book around um, adversity being a blessing yep. in disguise. A- adversity is the biggest blessing in disguise. Um, I was in Copenhagen on the same trip, and I rented a motor scooter so I could get around a little quicker, and I rounded the corner, and a car hit me. And I'm sprawling all over the ground and bleeding, 
And the same guy that hit me took me to the hospital. And he put the motor scooter in the trunk and took me off to the hospital where in, in Denmark they have you know free medicine. Mm-hmm. So they admitted me to the hospital with my American passport, bandaged me up, let me spend the night there. And the next day they released me and I said, well, who do I pay? And they said, oh, no one. That's what do you mean, no one? She, they said, well, we have, and believe me, and listen, they're speaking English, not Danish. Think about that. Because mm. if someone from Denmark came to America and didn't know English, they're screwed. Yeah. So, I mean, how did that change your perception of, say, the United States and its healthcare system and just people's attitudes in general? There was no policeman. Mm. They didn't need one. The guy who hit me did the right thing. Yeah. The people in the hospital didn't ask me for my insurance card. They, they didn't rail me against what I did or what I didn't do. They just accepted me, bandaged me up, patted me on the head, and told me to get on my way. Yeah. And by the way, in Denmark, they don't call them Danish pastries. They just call them pastries because <laughs> you're in Denmark. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's a very different type of society. And I think even today, it's still held up as an example of how good things can be um, when it comes to not just uh, social convention, not just healthcare, but also the education system, um, diversity, you name it. Um, it seems to be a utopian society across Denmark, Sweden, basically all of Scandinavia today. Yeah, it's, it's being a little, uh, well, let's just say that it's in jeopardy at the moment. Yeah. But, but I would say this, it taught me I'm great for free enterprise. I want capitalism to reign throughout the world. I'm I'm not a socialist kind of person, but we have so much barrier in our world with restrictions and rules and things for people's quote safety. And I'm I'm in favor of plant safety, but I'm not in favor of oppression. That you know you you do something wrong and you pay a major price for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there has to be some kind of do the right thing rule. And that, that applies universally. And maybe I'm a utopian, but I grew up in the 60s. We had ideals. Yeah. Uh, but I, but now, now in our world, if you look at something that was written 100 years ago, like Truthful Living, you get a real picture of who you need to become as a person by doing the right thing and know it's right for yourself and not to worry about what other people think about you or say about you or even do about you. Mm. Just go in your own way. Um, there's a, there's a, I'm a devotee of Earl Nightingale who wrote the strangest secret. It is arguably one of the greatest pieces of personal development ever recorded. I've only listened to it 500 times. Uh, maybe I'll pick another 500 and then that's it. I'm going to quit. But there's a, a bit of information that doesn't appear on the strangest secret that when he got out of the army, he decided he wanted to be, he wanted to be a radio announcer in Chicago and do these commercials for Jell-O and some of the big brands of the time. But he was only a hack in Phoenix. But he would read the commercial like he was doing it in Chicago. And his fellow employees would come up to him and say, what are you doing this for? Why are you trying to to get to this? And his response is, and I would just smile and go about my business. He didn't have to say, I'm doing this because I want to do it. He just went about it silently Mm. and, and achieved it. He had a definite major aim, and he concentrated, he focused, and he practiced. Yeah. Any great athlete, I don't care who they are, they practice every day. Yes. So on that, Jeffrey, practicing every day, um, doing the right thing, you mentioned you're a capitalist, not necessarily a socialist. Do you feel like in today's society – I mean, from where I'm sitting, it seems like we're moving away from this whole notion of the individual, um, of accountability towards, you know, collectivism and uh, entitlement. I mean, what's your view on that? Um, in a word? Mm-hmm. Bullshit. Yeah. Um, I'm an individualist. I will remain an individualist. I will teach my children to be individualists and capitalists uh, because I believe that that is the best answer in today's world. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not in favor. Uh, you know, th- there's a great um, Margaret Thatcher quote about uh, socialism that says, eventually you run out of other people's money. <laughs> and and I, <laughs> I think that that defines it in a sentence. Yeah. 
And, and uh, I think for me, uh, individualism, and I just tie it into things like um, uh, extreme ownership, accountability. Um, if you are an individual, then you're basically empowering yourself to do something about it. Like you've got a exactly. choice to and, be successful. Let me define something. I don't want to be accountable. I want to be responsible. Mm-hmm. Uh, people don't. People get into sales so they don't have to be accountable. I want to go out, make a bunch of sales calls, make a bunch of money, leave me alone. But if I make them responsible for themselves, I can make them see that their own success is in their own hands and that they are literally the CEO of their own domain and go out and do it for your family and for your car payment and for your kids' education. Do it for yourself and then you'll be able to do it very successfully for the company. Yeah, it's such a simple tweak. And this goes back to what we were discussing earlier, that a lot of these teachings, they're common sense, but common sense isn't very common. And the whole uh, um, idea of actually, it's easy for human beings to default to making excuses or to externalizing when something doesn't go right, because it makes us feel better about ourselves. But ultimately, by doing that, you're basically becoming a victim and you're not empowering yourself to do anything about it. So just by taking responsibility, you're already in a position of power where you're um, actions will then help move you closer towards that outcome that you're looking for. A couple of years ago, I read, uh, I wrote a piece called the sense of selling. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, you know, the sense of understanding what your position is, uh, the sense of being able to engage the other person emotionally. And it ended with, and the, and the most important sense that isn't spoken of is common sense because you're taught to either to some old world tactic of manipulation bullshit about finding the pain. You, you go off your own uh, rudder and you go off your, your own what feels right to you. I've always done what felt right to me, and that's always led me in the right direction because my family raised me to be a good person and an ethical person. They raised me to do the right thing, and they raised me to do the right thing all the time. And if you don't do it and you have a sense of responsibility – you basically employ your own guilt until you start to do it responsibly, until you start to do it the right way. I guess I just wanted to double click on that in terms of intuition. Is that something that's played a big role in your success? Yes. I'm intuitive because I'm intelligent. My, my parents were intelligent. That's where I got it from. I wasn't, you know, I was given the gift of intelligence and my choice is how to use it. How, how do I take that intelligence and move it to a level where I'm gratified by it and I feel good about it? And I can help other people. Mm-hmm. That's part of my philosophy. I help other people. And I'm good at it. And I love it. I have a sense of service, which, by the way, <laughs> interesting in this book, Napoleon Hill says you have to have a service heart, not a service policy. Mm-hmm. Big difference. Yeah. Policy tells you what you can't do. And so whenever I hear someone tell me what they can't do, I said, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you tell me what you can do? <laughs> yeah, it's very bureaucratic. It's like if you uh, approach a typical public servant with a problem, they'll respond with the policy rather than a solution. It stymies them. I'll just say that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I guess on, on taking ownership, um, Jeffrey, one thing um, I would love to tease out from the book is a, an incident um, at Illinois Central Railroad Station on creating your own luck. Well, um, I, everybody seems to be cognizant of luck. People will say, if it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck. My father taught me hard work makes luck. Mm -hmm. And thinking in the right direction makes luck. If you want the story, buy the book. But if you want to understand, if you want to understand what the essence of it is, don't Put yourself in a position where you don't feel lucky. Put yourself in a position where you're willing to work hard and do whatever it takes, and all of a sudden, luck appears. Yeah. It's not about buying a lottery ticket. You will never win the lottery, especially if you have all your teeth, because yeah. it seems as though people that win the lottery are somewhat toothless. It's, it's a great point. And um, uh, Annie Duke was one of my former guests. She was a World Series of Poker champion, and, and now she's a deci- decision-making strategist. And she always talks about the notion that there is no such thing as luck, but by doing the work, you increase your chances of a positive outcome. That's basically exactly. luck. Exactly. Pluck is what Hill pluck. talks about. Yes. Turn yes. luck into luck comes from pluck. Luck. And 
uh, that was a word that was used in the old days. It meant you were willing to go out and get the job done no matter what. I, I tell people, and this is pretty interesting, if you make a goal, instead of a period at the end, put a comma at the end and add, even if my ass falls off, and that will make that goal come true. I'm going to lose 20 pounds, even if my ass falls off. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make three sales a week, even if my ass falls off. Yeah. And that puts that that um, uh, the emotional expression to it that's missing from a standard logical goal. Add emotion it, and stir and work your ass off and you're fine. Couldn't agree more. If you, if you, uh, again, common sense, common sense. But we've only got a, a few minutes left, Jeffrey, so I wanted to oh. – uh, but as I like to do with all of my guests, I wanted to uh, throw you into our three-question lightning round. Cool. Let's do this. Cool. All righty. So I'm not sure how you answer the first question because you've been an entrepreneur for a long time, but I ask people if you could work for any organization at any stage of the company life cycle. So you could be going back to 1905 and working with Henry Ford. Who would it be and why? I would be Jeff Bezos' personal assistant. I would have been Steve Jobs' personal assistant, but he's passed on. Yeah. And I would work for nothing. Yeah. Well, and that's that, that, that speaks volumes about your uh, how much you value education and knowledge. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's a great answer. Right. Question number two, Jeffrey, if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, it may be Napoleon Hill, um, who would you ask and what would you ask? I would ask my dad for more of his wisdom. Mm-hmm. I would ask my dad for what his relationship was like with his dad, because that's where he got his wisdom. Yeah. It's important to understand family as much as it is to understand anything in the world. My life revolves around my family. I'm a family guy. I watch Family Guy, but I also am a family guy. Yeah. Would you say that the more you understand your family, your parents, um, where they came from, the more you understand yourself and then you can better understand how you operate in the world? Yes. Yeah. I understand how I got to be where I am. Mm-hmm. I, I work hard and I work long and hard, but I'm grateful for everything that, that comes with me. I'm, I, I look at my when – when I, when I took the little red book of selling out of the box from, from China, the, the 51st state of America – I began to cry because I knew I had a brand Mm -hmm. and the little red book has gone on to become the best selling sales book of all time. But what I want to make certain of is that I constantly understand that I don't know enough and I continue to need to learn more. And when you can find something like this book, that's a hundred years old and learn new things from it, it blows your doors off. And for me, it makes me happy. Like, Oh, I learned something new. Not like, oh, shit, I should have known that, or I've always known that. There's ways of looking at things. Like people say, I, I already knew that. You know what? People, Salespeople already know everything. The problem is they don't do it. And what I want to ask people is, I don't care if you know it, on a scale of 1 to 10, how good are you at it? Yeah. And so I always rate myself. When I see a new fact, even if I knew the fact and it was a, a reminder to me, I still ask myself, how good am I at that? And then I make a game plan to get better. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, lucky last question, Jeffrey, is you've obviously touched on some of your morning routines, some of your routines around concentration and focus. Uh, do you have any other rituals uh, or things you partake in on a daily basis to help you stay um, not necessarily focused, but just to help you performing at the level you're performing at? I try my best to build relationships on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Uh, The most successful people I know had great relationships with everyone that meant something to them. And I try my best with the people that I work with on an everyday basis, my friends on an everyday basis, my customers on an everyday basis, but certainly my family. And I try my best to incorporate some kind of wisdom and some kind of help into every conversation. If I'm able to do that, I feel great. And I've never, I've done 2,500 seminars for corporations over the past 20 years. I've never not learned something from each one of them. Mm -hmm. So regardless of how they felt, and they, you know, feel great about it, I'm a wiser person as a result of having done them. 
Yeah. Same with writing. Every time I write, I learn. Yeah. And I think that's such a valuable lesson there that you just acknowledge that you're always learning and you never know everything. And it's going back to Socrates, all I know is I know nothing. Or the, the more you know, the more you know, you know nothing. And just realizing that every single person you meet, you can learn something from um, is such a valuable sort of philosophy to, um, exactly. to operate yeah, from. Exactly. Um, so people can pick up or they can pre-order a copy of Truthful Living Truth, Today. Yeah, just go, go to Amazon. Yep, of course, on Amazon as well as all of your other uh, books on sales. Um, they're all up there. They can hit up gitoma.com um, to find out more um, insights on leadership, networking, personal development, sales, and so on. And of course, you you, you co-host a podcast called Sell. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sell uh, Why don't you come on our podcast and be our guest? Man, I'd love to be your guest. You know what? Your Your accent will attract all kinds of listeners. Yeah. Because people who have British accents, South African accents, Australian accents, or even New Zealand accents, people perceive them as brighter than we are. It's, it's funny. I was actually speaking at a conference in Nebraska a couple of months ago, Jeffrey, and um, the MC, as soon as I got off the stage, said the exact same thing. He said, you know, it's funny when people speak in an Australian accent, they just sound so much smarter than us. Yeah. <laughs> That's very true. And I think we, we think the exact same thing about Americans. So there you go. Oh, so I should come over and I'd be perceived as smarter? Exactly. This is why I've got you on the show, Jeffrey. It's got nothing to do with your books. It's just your accent. Thank you very kindly. We'll have a beer and we'll discuss it. It's somewhere between here and the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, actually, the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean, indeed. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much, Jeffrey, for giving up some time to appear on Future Squared. Um, you've left us with a, a lot of value and hopefully people not only listen and, and learn, but also apply, uh, more importantly, what we've been discussing today. So thank you again. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Hi guys, Steve again. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, ebooks, and more that I'm publishing on a regular basis, just leave your details at futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe, and you'll receive the very next one. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, please take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play or Spotify, it goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. Until next time, Future Squared is out.